Welcome to this, your last module in your course on the fourfold gospel. I want to commend you for the great job that you've done. I know you have done a fine job if you've made it this far. So again, thanks for all of your hard work throughout this course. It's a very compressed course. We know this. Uh, we just have eight weeks devoted to four gospels. There are so many other things that we really should talk about and need to talk about, but we simply don't have time to do this. I think the reading assignment has uh, given you a lot of context and has uh, filled in perhaps a lot of gaps in your understanding of the fourfold gospels before you took this class. But of course, we need to spend the rest of our lives studying the fourfold gospel. So I hope this course has given you a foundation for doing that. Uh, has given you a foundation for further study and has introduced you to some of the principal authors that I think would be well worth spending time with after this class is over. And one of those authors that I want to particularly commend to you is a man by the name of Richard Balcom. We've seen him before and I want to uh, spend a little bit of time with him in this final module. And I want to take you a little deeper, a little further into a very important work that has been recently been published, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. We've seen this before. We have uh, been introduced to uh, some of the main tenets that Richard Balcom writes about in that book, but I wanna take you a little further in this, and this is what I want to leave you with in this course, on the value of eyewitness testimony. And this is something that's been neglected in New Testament scholarship it was not at all an emphasis when I was in school. In this module, I want to explain why uh, the value of eyewitness testimony had been lost, especially in the 20th century, and how men, scholars like Richard Balcom, have been trying to retrieve the value of eyewitness testimony and showing how eyewitness testimony is embedded in the fourfold gospel. Now, he's certainly not the only scholar who's doing this. There's also a man by the name of Martin Hengel at uh, the University of Tübingen in Germany. Tübingen is an extremely important center of Catholic theology, and uh, it's been influential uh, in the church, oh, easily since the for the last two to three hundred years. Tübingen is an important uh, Catholic faculty that is producing extremely important work in uh, academic circles. Uh, Martin Hengel has written along the lines of Richard Balcom in terms of recovering the historicity and the value of eyewitness testimony in the Gospels. Uh, N.T. Wright uh, doesn't write so much on the Gospels. He's a Pauline scholar, but he would be someone that I would put in this same camp. Someone who has all of the historical critical apparatus at his command, and yet has moved past some of the more problematic positions of historical criticism to uh, open the, uh, well, the mind, let's say, of readers today to uh, the value of eyewitness testimony. So Martin Hengel, N.T. Wright, uh, Richard B. Hayes uh, is also more of a Pauline scholar, but he has uh, written a book that was just published this past year called Reading Backwards, uh, the Figural Christology in the Fourfold Gospel. I would highly recommend this book to you. Richard B. Hayes, he teaches at Duke, and it's a book that you would be perfectly primed to read now that you've completed this course, but if you look at uh, Richard B. Hayes' book, Reading Backwards, it shows how the Old Testament has been uh, incorporated into uh, the Fourfold Gospel. So. Richard B. Hayes isn't so much interested in the value of eyewitness testimony, but he uh, certainly has the same kind of approach and respect and stance that Richard Balcom does in terms of using all of the linguistic and historical critical apparatus, but uh, now there's a next wave of scholarship that is trying to return to an understanding and a, really an appreciation for the value of the historicity of the Gospels and uh, eyewitness testimony with respect to Richard Bauckham. Let me just briefly summarize uh, some of the main tenets that we saw previously in an earlier module from Richard Bauckham's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. 
uh, he notes that public persons are normally named in the gospel. So we have Herod the Great, we have John the Baptist, we have the apostles. Uh, it's interesting when a public person is not named. And so um, I'll explain this in just a little bit, but in this book, Balcom wonders why isn't Caiaphas ever named in the Gospel of Mark? Why is the high priest Caiaphas, obviously a very public person alongside Herod, why uh, does the name of Caiaphas never appear in the Gospel of Mark? Uh, Richard Balcom is going to uh, address that because it does seem an exception to his basic trend that most of the public persons surrounding the ministry of Jesus are named. And they are in the Gospels, but not in the Gospel of Mark when it comes to Caiaphas. Something interesting is going on there. Balcom also notes that most people who were the recipients of healing miracles never receive a name in the Gospels, and we've seen why earlier in a previous module. Most of those people probably just received that healing and then didn't end up following Christ. They returned to their previous way of life. Their names were lost to obscurity and they did not become members of the early church. Since they did not become members of the church, their names were lost uh, to obscurity. That's uh, one reason why uh, people are not named in the Gospels. If, they're, if they just encounter Jesus once, if they're just the beneficiaries of a miracle and they don't end up staying with the church, then their names are lost. Uh, so we're going to look at, in this module, why some people are named and why they're not named. And the basic uh, purpose is going to be because they were eyewitness, eyewitnesses in one way or another. So let's uh, uh, delve into this a little deeper. Let me uh, hold up a few points that I want to raise here and then I'm going to answer them and address them throughout the rest of this module. So the first point I want to make, if Richard Balcom talks about public persons being named in the Gospels as evidence that eyewitnesses are at work here, why is Caiaphas never named in the Gospel of Mark? That's something that I want to address and answer in this module. Then also on the road to Emmaus, at the end of Luke's Gospel, why is only one person named Cleophas and the other person who's walking with him remains unnamed? Why just name one person in that episode, Cleophas, and not the other? I will present Balcom's explanation for that as well. Then also, why uh, not only name Simon of Cyrene, but also his two sons, Alexander and Rufus? Alexander and Rufus do next to nothing in the gospel scene, yet their names are there, where the people who uh, were involved with some of the greatest miracles that Jesus worked, especially the healing miracles, were never named. Why name Alexander and Rufus in Mark 15, 21? And then finally, we have a lot of anonymous individuals, recipients of miracles uh, in the gospels, but sometimes they're named and sometimes they're not. And so only John names Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane as the one who takes the sword and cuts off his ear. Only John does this. Why is Peter not named in the Garden of Gethsemane? Remember, Peter is such an important influence upon Mark and is such a prominent person in the Gospel of Mark. Why does John name Peter alone as the one who wields the sword, but Mark doesn't. You think Mark would name Peter there as the one who wields the sword, since Peter is so important to Mark, and since Mark is getting so much of his information from Peter. Why does Mark omit the name of Peter in the Gospel of Mark? And then also, only John gives us the name of whose ear was severed, Malchus. Why only in John? Why does that name only appear in John? Now remember, John is, uh, by everyone's agreement, the last gospel written, maybe written around the year 90, 100 AD perhaps. Some have dated it as late as 120 AD. That seems to be getting a little late uh, in my opinion, but still, definitely John is the last gospel of the four to be written. Why does the gospel of John name Peter 
as the one who wields the sword, and the name of the high priest's slave, Malchus, as the one who has his ear cut off. That's what I want to start with here. And I think this will explain a lot once we see why uh, this is going on in John and not in Mark. Why does John alone name Peter and Malchus? Well, there was an extremely influential scholar back in the uh, early to mid 20th century by the name of Rudolf Bultmann. Rudolf Bultmann, he was actually born at the end of the 19th. He's born in 1884 but he lives a very long and productive life. He dies in 1976. Rudolf Bultmann, he wrote a book in 1921 called The History of the Synoptic Tradition. And this is the book that made Rudolf Bultmann an academic superstar. It is impossible to exaggerate the influence this one book had upon New Testament studies. The History of the Synoptic Tradition by Rudolf Bultmann. It dominated the field of New Testament scholarship. It establishes Bultmann as the uh, preeminent New Testament scholar of his day. He goes on to write several other commentaries, including a very important commentary on the Gospel of John. But this uh, book in 1921 just clears the decks and no one can hold a candle to Rudolf Bultmann starting with the publication of this book in 1921, throughout the rest of his academic career, he was unparalleled as a New Testament scholar. Uh, no one dared question Herr Dr. Bultmann, as he was called in German academic circles. Uh, again, his, his every word was accepted. Uh, no one uh, dared to question anything that he wrote. He was uh, completely alone in terms of uh, New Testament scholars and everyone else was running up, running second uh, place behind Rudolf Bultmann. Now this is not healthy and we need to have people, uh, you know, criticizing and critiquing scholars and because of this book and his, uh, his undeniable brilliance, uh, no one questioned Bultmann or his assertions. He, he just, again, uh, was the dominant player in terms of New Testament scholarship until another generation or two later. Some of his students started to raise questions about his work and then another generation and more and more people started to question Bultmann. But during his lifetime, the deference that was paid to him was such that uh, really no one questioned his scholarship. Now, Bultmann's answer, sorry, I started to try to say that with a German pronunciation. Bultmann's answer to why does John name Peter and Malchus was this. He said in his book, The History of the Synoptic Tradition, that there's a tendency in the Gospels toward novelistic interest. Novelistic interest. Meaning that as the stories are told and retold, Later gospel authors want to make them more interesting, more vivid, more concrete. And so he said, giving names to these characters later on helps to make the story more vivid and more interesting. It's basically the stories get better the more often they're told kind of thing. So that's why he said John, who comes so late in gospel composition, names Peter and names Malchus. John is like a novelist trying to make his stories more interesting and, and more vivid and giving names to the stories just makes them so. Now, I can imagine what some of you are thinking if you're listening closely. If it's novelistic interest that's at work and if the later Gospels are just enhancing the stories to make them more interesting, they might be more vivid but they're less truthful. If the later Gospel are just adding names for the sake of making their stories more interesting. Yeah, they might be more interesting, but they're also less true. And no one questioned Bultmann on this for generations. And really, it's been the latest wave of New Testament scholars like Richard Balcom and others. There were some before him, but only now are people starting to come out from under the spell of Rudolf Bultmann. It happened probably a little earlier, but still, uh, Balcom and others are starting to overturn much of Bultmann's scholarship. And Richard Balcom 
in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, simply decides to, to check, to see, is this true? Is it true that the later Gospels simply add names to characters that appear in earlier Gospels? And Balcom decides to check Bultmann's assertion, and he <laughs> discovers that in no case does this ever happen. Bultmann was completely wrong. This idea of novelistic interest, it's just not operating in the New Testament. According to Balcom, in no case does an unnamed character in Mark actually get a name in John. In no case is an unnamed character uh, provided a name just to make the stories more interesting. In fact, Balcom, by observing and, and, and checking, notes just the opposite that Mark names people and their names start to drop out. So here are some examples. So Mark 10.46 names Bartimaeus as the blind man who's sitting by the roadside begging, but Matthew in Matthew 20 verse 30 and Luke in chapter 18 verse 35 do not. So Bartimaeus is named in Mark, but his name drops out later. And no in no case is a gospel writer just enhancing his story by adding names. In fact, we see just the opposite, that the names start to drop out. Now, why do the names drop out? There can be lots of reasons. Hebrew names don't mean much to a Greek audience. That's one reason. Uh, perhaps Bartimaeus was well known in the circle in which Mark was writing. He's not well known in the other gospels. His name could drop out for that reason. Plus, really, it's not the name of the person that matters so much all the time. It's what Jesus does that matters. I mean, the fact that Jesus heals the leper is more important than what that leper's name actually was. So we see this tendency, Balcom notes, that nowhere does a later gospel just add a name for the sake of making the story more interesting. In fact, just the opposite happens. So the healing of Jairus' daughter in Mark 5:22. Luke retains the name Jairus. He keeps that name in Luke 8, 41, but Matthew does not. Matthew does not retain Jairus' name. So, uh, actually, when somebody finally checked Rudolf Bultmann's assertion, they noted that it wasn't true. In fact, just the opposite is true. A lot of people are named earlier in Mark, the first gospel, but their names drop out for lots of different reasons over time. Now, there are, however, these two exceptions that I noted earlier. The two exceptions to this are Peter is named only by John as the one who cuts off the ear of the high priest slave Malchus. This is only in John. It's not in the earlier Gospels. So, was Boltman kind of, sort of right about this? Is there a novelistic interest here after all? No, uh, actually not. I mean, there's another explanation that I'm going to give you, but also notice so many really important episodes happen to people in the Gospel of John and were never given their names. And so, uh, you know, the Samaritan woman at the well, magnificent uh, uh, chapter in John. We don't ever get her name. If John was just trying to make his stories more vivid by naming people that appear earlier in other uh, parts of the tradition, why not name the Samaritan woman? Or the paralyzed man? Or the woman caught in adultery? They're never named in John. So novelistic interest is not what's going on here. There are so many episodes in John where these people are not named. So that, that's not what was going on. There's a different theory that I want to present to you. It's in Richard Balcom's book. He gets it from a guy by the name of Gerd Thyssen. And so if you read Balcom, you'll find that this theory actually comes from a man by the name of Gerd Thiessen. And he says the reason why John names Peter and the high priest slave Malchus is because of, well, protective anonymity. Now let me explain this. What Gerd Thiessen argues, and it's in Balcom's book, is that by the time John writes, his gospel, the situation in the church has changed. That dangers have passed. Uh, the world is different when John writes his gospel than when Mark wrote his. When Mark wrote his gospel, 
Well, let me just explain it to you like this. In Mark, many of the uh, key figures are not named. And in fact, not only are they not named in Mark, their identity is obscured in Mark. Now, it's not a question of unnamed people in Mark getting names later in the Gospels because of novelistic interest, Bultmann's theory. We've seen that that's, that doesn't hold water. But still, if you look carefully in the Gospel of Mark, Mark is doing something different than John, really something different than the other three Gospels. In Mark, uh, some of the people's identities seem to be deliberately obscured. And uh, let me just point this out to you now. So we have in Mark 14, 51, of course, the very uh, well-known episode of the young man fleeing naked from the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, people have speculated that's Mark uh, making a cameo appearance. Probably not. But uh, the, the main thing here is this man's identity is definitely obscured. We know this. But let's look closer and we'll see there are many other uh, people in the Gospel of Mark where their identity seems to be deliberately obscured and uh, Just hang with me for this. I'm going to show you where they where these obscure identities are and then we'll I'll double back around and show you how protective anonymity is what's going on here. Mark is protecting people He's protecting the identities of some people in his gospel and I will let me show you this first and then I'll explain to you why so Mark 14 we have lots of characters who are unnamed, but even some of them seem to be uh, deliberately obscured. There are some awkward phrases to describe some people whose identity should be crystal clear. So look at Mark 14, 4. One of the bystanders. Now that's an odd way to refer to one of the 12 apostles. One of the bystanders. Uh, it seems that Mark is deliberately trying to uh, conceal something, trying to conceal the identity. But it's, he knows who the 12 apostles are, and yet he doesn't refer to the apostles, certainly not by name, but even more, he doesn't even refer to them as apostles, but refers to them as one of the bystanders. Now, Matthew and Luke are going to clarify this. Okay, let's uh, compare these citations and the synoptic gospels. Let's look at Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark 14:47. Go to Mark 14:47 and you'll see that it's one of the bystanders who grabs the sword and cuts off uh, the ear of the high priest slave. Now, uh, that's an odd way to refer to the disciples. Only those closest to Jesus who were with him at the last supper go with him to the garden of Gethsemane. So, referring to the disciples as a bystander it seems like Mark is trying to protect someone. He's trying to protect their identity. He's trying to hide their identity. He doesn't refer to Jesus' closest friends and disciples as such. Instead, they're just casually referred to as a bystander. Now again, Matthew and Luke are going to not do this. So in Matthew 26, verse 51, it's clearly one of the disciples who cuts off the guy's ear. It's one who accompanied Jesus, Matthew says, who grabs the sword and uh, attacks the high priest slave. Obviously, one who accompanied Jesus belongs to him. And Luke makes it even clearer in Luke 22, 50, when it's clearly one of the disciples who cuts off uh, the man's ear. But in Mark, it's more vague. It's much more uh, blurred. It's just one of the bystanders. That implies no relationship with Jesus. Again, isn't that odd that Mark would choose to refer to one of the, the apostles, Jesus' closest disciples, as bystanders? But it gets uh, even curiouser, as it says in Alice in Wonderland. Uh, we'll see this throughout the Passion. But let me uh, suggest why this might be the case. Why would Mark need to protect anybody? Why would he need to hide their identity, the identity of the apostles? Well, remember what Jesus does on Palm Sunday. Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem triumphantly. The crowd is singing Hosanna to the Son of David. He is being proclaimed the Messiah. He's being proclaimed the leader. This is a direct affront to Rome and to the Jewish high priests and the priesthood establishment in Rome. This is treason, really. 
For Jesus to march into the city of Jerusalem and proclaim himself the Messiah, this is a direct challenge to the powers that were governing the city at the time, Rome and the, the high priestly class. Jesus entering the city like that, that's an act of treason. It's sedition. It's a capital offense to come into Jerusalem like that, to throw down the gauntlet like that. Uh, so there would be a good reason to have to protect the identity of those with Jesus because they're all involved in treason. And what's more, to take a sword and to cut off the high priest's ear, well, he's lucky he just cut off the ear, I guess, because if he were to take that sword and aim a little lower, he could have killed that guy in Mark. Attacking the high priest's slave, that was a capital offense. That was striking practically right at the high priest himself. And so uh, to be involved with attempted murder, treason, uh, political unrest. In the Gospel of Mark, Mark is deliberately hiding identities because of the danger. The danger of the political unrest, the danger that uh, Rome is going to arrest and capture them, uh, the danger of committing treason and murder. Mark has good reason to uh, protect the identity of the disciples in Jerusalem. Now, perhaps you can see already that for Balcom, he's going to take a different approach in terms of where the Gospel of Mark was written. For Balcom, the Gospel of Mark was written in Jerusalem, and he's got lots of other reasons why, but this theory of his only works if the Gospel of Mark is written in Jerusalem, and also if it's written earlier. Most of us date the Gospel of Mark after 70 AD in the city of Rome. That's the traditional designation, and I would say that's the consensus opinion. But Balcom uh, has a, a different take on this, and he has the Gospel of Mark written in Jerusalem shortly after the events of the crucifixion at a time when there was still danger and, uh, and political unrest, when the threat was still real. You know, in Acts, of the apostles, we hear that James will be executed. Now, in the Acts of the Apostles, it says that Herod was the one who executes James, but Herod, remember, was the puppet king, but uh, the high priest was a guy by Annuas. Annuas. He's going to be the nephew of Caiaphas. We know this from Josephus and his history of the Jewish wars. So, even as late as 44 AD, when the Apostle James is executed, we can see it's still a time of turmoil, of tension, of danger. And so Balcom is going to say it's in this context of treason and murder and persecution, where not only is Jesus crucified, but James will be killed in 44 AD. Balcom has the Gospel of Mark written in this context. Now, Again, you can see that just about every scholar is going to come up with his reasons for this. Uh, there's no conclusive proof either way, but again, we learn a lot even by listening to these theories. And let me continue with this. So if we see the danger that is hanging over the city of Jerusalem, even after the death of Christ for the next 10 years or so, uh, by the, the persecution of the Jewish high priestly class against the followers of Jesus, most notably James, even after his death, we get a little bit of a sense of why Mark is trying to protect the disciples, because the danger is still real. When he writes his gospel, the danger is still real. Let's look at a couple other examples of this. Notice in Mark 11, verses 1 to 7, let's look at that now. Mark 11, verses 1 to 7. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. When they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately upon entering it, you will find a colt tethered on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone should say to you, Why are you doing this? Reply, The master has need of it, and will send it back here at once. So they went off and found a colt tethered at a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders, again that word, said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? 
They answered them just as Jesus had told them to, and they permitted them to do it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and put their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. And then the rest of the entry of Jerusalem happens. Now, what's going on here? Balcom says it's interesting that they're not going to the owner of the colt. The owner of the colt is never identified. This colt is just out there, tethered uh, at some hitching post. So the owner's being protected. The owner of the colt is not identified. Remember, if the owner is named, he's involved in all of this. He would be implicated in the treason and uh, he too could be subject to arrest, even death, just by being involved with this, again, act of treason that Jesus is committing against the ruling powers at that time, Rome and the high priestly class. So uh, again, it, it almost functions as a password, as a secret sign. Here's this cult tethered there, left there by somebody who doesn't want to be implicated or whom Mark does not want to implicate. And then these bystanders see this and they ask, what are you doing untying the cult? And the two disciples, unnamed, give the response Jesus said, they hear it, and then they let the cult go free. They let the cult go with them, I should say. It's like this is a prearranged sign, Balcom says, that Jesus has given them the password to give to the bystanders to allow them to untie the cult, to bring it to Jesus, without anyone being implicated in any of this. It's fascinating. Uh, but there's one more incident that I'd like to point out to you that's in Mark. It's in Mark 14, 12 to 16. Let's look at Mark 14, 12 to 16. Mark 14, 12. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you, carrying a jar of water. Follow him. Whenever he ent wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I will eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. The disciples went off, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, what's interesting here is Jesus doesn't tell the two disciples where they're going to have the Passover meal. He keeps that secret from them. He says, go into the city and you'll meet a man carrying a water jar. Follow him. He'll take you to the place, to the householder where we're going to have the Passover. Notice the owner of the house, his residence, uh, the owner of that residence is never named either. Instead, they are to go in and they see this, again, almost like a secret sign that's been arranged. It's almost like something out of a James Bond movie. When you see a man carrying a water jar, you follow him and he'll take you where the Passover is going to be celebrated. Now, how could the disciples know they were following the right guy, this man with a water jar? How could they know that he was supposed to be this prearranged sign? Well, for the simple reason that men never did this. Men never carried water. That was women's work. A man never carried a jar of water. Only women would be allowed to do this. In fact, you know, I've tried to find images of men carrying water for you. I, I can only find those of women carrying jugs of water because only women did this back then. A man would never uh, stoop to uh, carry water. That was the job of the women. They had to do that every day. The men didn't do that. So that's why they would know that this was the prearranged sign when they see a man carrying the jar of water and they were to follow him. Again, in Mark's gospel, Judas is already at work. He, his betrayal has already been set into motion. And you can see how ominous it is in Mark, the danger against the disciples. Uh, the danger and the, the, the strife that's in the city, the, the political unrest that's hanging over Jerusalem at this time, it, it's so palpable in Mark. And remember, Judas has already started his betrayal. So to keep the location secret where Jesus is going to eat this meal that he desperately wants to eat, he keeps it sacred, secret from all the other apostles. Nobody knows where it's going to be eaten in Mark. 
Instead, the two disciples have to go in and find this man carrying this water jar. They have to run into their secret contact and then follow him to the secret location where the Passover meal is going to be celebrated. To keep it secret from Judas, Jesus keeps it secret from everybody in the Gospel of Mark. Again, we get a sense of the impending doom and uh, just the, um, the danger that hangs so thick over Jerusalem in the Gospel of Mark. This is, according to Gerd Thyssen, the reason for the protective anonymity in the Gospel of Mark. According to these scholars, Mark wrote his Gospel in Jerusalem at a time shortly after the crucifixion of Jesus when the danger was still real. And we see this real danger because James, the Apostle James, is executed in 44 AD by the high priestly class. Uh, by the nephew of Caiaphas. And so because this danger is so real and so palpable, Mark is protecting identities of those disciples involved with this admittedly treasonous work of Jesus. That's why Peter is not named in Mark as the one who cuts off the ear of the high priest's slave. Peter is not named because Mark is protecting Peter because uh, Peter could still be alive and if this was written in Jerusalem, Peter could still be in Jerusalem along with Mark, according to uh, Balcom's theory. Now, this also explains then why John can name Peter and name Malchus freely without risking anybody's injury. When John writes his gospel, Peter's long dead, and so there's no need to protect the identity of Peter in the gospel of John. John is written in Ephesus and Turkey there's no danger. It's not written in Jerusalem. There's no need to protect the identity of Peter. He can freely name Peter in the Gospel of John. Remember also the temple's been destroyed 70 AD by the time John writes his Gospel. The high priests are no more. The high priestly class, that whole caste, was wiped out in 70 AD. They're not a threat either to anybody. So with the destruction of the temple, the high priestly class, that persecuted the early Christians and even martyred the Apostle James, they're all gone. So now John can freely name Peter as the one who cuts off the slaves, the slave of the high priest's ear, Malchus. And we also know perhaps why John would know the identity of the high priest's slave, Malchus, because if John was a part, if it was John the Elder, who is a part of that high priestly class, who converts to Christianity, who becomes a follower of Jesus, he would certainly know who Caiaphas' slave was. He would know his name. Another reason, perhaps, uh, why John the Elder could have written the Gospel of John, and also why he's free to name names in John that are not in Mark, because the danger is past by the time John writes his Gospel. Fascinating theory. Uh, it does, it's not entirely convincing to me. You could poke some holes in it. Uh, but again, this is the kind of scholarship that's in Richard Balcom's book. So if you're looking for something to read, you would have a great time reading Jesus and the eyewitnesses. A couple other points I want to make from that book before I wrap up this module. Okay, we've seen uh, both on the intensive weekend and in a previous module, we've looked at um, the Two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Easter Sunday morning, magnificent uh, gospel event. And we've seen that Cleophas is the one named, and there is another unnamed disciple who's walking along the road that Jesus uh, comes up to, and then of course the rest of the events unfold as we well know. Now, Cleophas alone is named. What's going on there? Well, again, this comes from Balcom in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. He notes that in John 19.25, the Gospel of John, there's a clopas named. C-L-O-P-A-S. There's a clopas named. Now, clopas is the Hebrew version of Cleophas. Cleophas is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Clopas. So we've seen this before in a previous module, how many people back then had a Hebrew name and a Greek name. So Balcom is going to say that this Cleophas, who's walking along the road in Luke's uh, gospel on the road to Emmaus, is the same man as this Clopas who's mentioned 
uh, under the, near the cross in John 19.25. Now, who was this Clopas who's also named Cleophas? Well, in Eusebius, who comes you know, in the 4th century, who writes his uh, extremely influ influential book, The Ecclesiastical History, Eusebius records that there was a Clopas who was known to be the brother of Joseph, the foster father of Jesus. Clopas, according to Eusebius, was Jesus' familial uncle. He wasn't his blood uncle, obviously, because Joseph isn't his, his biological father. But the brother of Joseph, let's say Jesus' uncle by family, was a Clopas. That's who's named in John. 1925. That Clopas is the same Cleophas who's on the road to Emmaus and Luke. So it's Jesus' uncle who's on the road to Emmaus. Even Jesus' own family member has given up on him. On Easter Sunday, he's walking back home on the road to Emmaus. That's who Jesus approaches in the Gospel of Luke. And then, of course, his eyes are opened and he believes. Okay, so this explains why uh, in John, we hear that Mary, the wife of Clopas, was the one who was uh, near the cross in the Gospel of John. Mary, the wife of Clopas. So Clopas is Jesus' uncle, according to Eusebius. And it's the same man who is walking on the road to Emmaus, who's named Cleophas. Eyewitnesses. Mary, the wife of Clopas, they are eyewitnesses to the crucifixion and also to the resurrection. The eyewitness testimony of Mary and Clopas, Cleophas, was so uh, determinative and influential in the early church. We see this also when we look at uh, Simon of Cyrene and his two boys, Alexander and Rufus. Now again, according to Balcom's main, uh, one of his main trends, somebody who only encounters Jesus once is usually not named. Simon of Cyrene encounters Jesus only once, and he is uh, definitely named <clears throat> in Matthew 27, verse 32, and in Luke 23, verse 26, and in Mark 15, 21, where he's not only Simon of Cyrene, he's also the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, Alexander and Rufus's names drop out later. They are not named in Matthew and in Luke, but they definitely are in Mark. Why are they named in Mark? Again, according to Balcom, they serve as eyewitnesses. So we have Simon of Cyrene as one of the main eyewitnesses of the Passion. He was there. He carried the cross. Remember in Mark, Peter has dropped out of the story. He's fled. Peter is nowhere near the cross, sad to say. Again, one of the failures of Peter and the other male apostles in the Gospel of Mark. Some women at a distance. Uh, better than nothing, but still, the men, especially Peter, have fled. Who's the eyewitness that Mark is relying upon here? Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene is named because he became a member of the early church. He's named because he's an eyewitness, and Mark is relying upon the testimony of Simon of Cyrene and his two sons, Alexander and Rufus. They serve as the key eyewitnesses for Mark in this section of his gospel. Uh, until the women at the tomb, and we know what happens to them there. So, again, you see how Balcom is relying upon eyewitness testimony. Balcom is saying, I should say, the gospel writers are relying upon eyewitness testimony, and it undergirds the gospel witness. And so, uh, it, it has nothing to do with uh, novelistic tendency, instead it has everything to do with eyewitness testimony. That's why uh, the people who are named are named as such, especially in the Gospel of Mark, as we've just seen. But there's one more occurrence in the Gospel of John that I want to return to one last time uh, to, to further make the point of uh, those who are unnamed are there uh, for, uh, for a different reason, but equally important. Let's look one more time at John 21. In John 21, verse 2, we're given a list of seven disciples. John 21, verse 2. Let's look at who those seven are. 21, verse 2. So Peter is going fishing back up at the Sea of Galilee. Uh, together on that fishing expedition were Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, 
Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons. Notice this is the only time that John, son of Zebedee, is even mentioned in the Gospel of John. And it's very much in passing. He's not even named as John. He's just referred to as Zebedee's sons. Again, maybe another telltale sign that this gospel was written by John the Elder, not John, the son of Zebedee. It's just Zebedee's sons and two others of his disciples, two others who are unnamed. We have seven total, not 12. We have seven. Why seven? Well, we've seen before with gematria that seven is the number of perfection, it's the number of completion. It's the number of fulfillment. And so we have seven disciples here. Five are named and two are not. Two are unnamed. Now we can presume that one of the unnamed disciples here is the beloved disciple. He's the one recounting this episode. So we can safely assume that one of these unnamed disciples is the beloved disciple. Who's the other one? Why has his identity been blurred? Why is he not named? Why has his identity been obscured? Not because of protective anonymity, for a different reason. Perhaps the beloved disciple is creating room for you in the Gospel of John. He wants you to join the number of disciples. He wants you to become a part of this group, a part of this tight-knit group of disciples. He wants to create room for you among the seven. If seven is the number of perfection and completion, he wants to carve out room for you among the number, among the members who are disciples of Jesus. If seven represents the fulfillment of the disciples, it represents all the disciples. It's the complete, perfect number of all the disciples of Jesus. So perhaps he's deliberately obscured the name here to allow you to see yourself in that role, to insert yourself into this band of brothers to see yourself as one of Jesus' disciples, working alongside the other disciples. Isn't that what the Christian life is all about? Isn't this why the Gospels were written, all four of them, to make us disciples of Jesus? Perhaps this is why there's this other unnamed disciple there to just give enough room for you to see yourself as belonging to this uh, tight-knit band of followers of Jesus. I sure hope so. I hope you see yourself as such as we bring this course to a conclusion. I hope you see yourself as uh, not just a disciple, but as one of the seven now, as one of constituting this perfect fulfillment of disciples, that you can see yourself in there, that you're not just a disciple, but a better disciple because you've taken this course, that you're a stronger disciple, and that you want to be an even better disciple as uh, you move forward uh, after this course. The fourfold gospel, it's written to make us disciples of Jesus Christ. It's written out of the faith of these men who wrote it, and it's meant to deepen our faith, and I hope this class has done that. I hope it has given you a taste for how to study the fourfold gospel, and I hope that you will do this for the rest of your life, that you will not stop here, that you will continue to study and to learn and to um, just continue to immerse yourself in the fourfold gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, let me close with that line. I've quoted it before, but I, I think it's a perfect way to end. Which of the four gospels is my favorite, is your favorite? I hope it's whatever gospel you happen to be studying at the time, and I hope that you will continue to study the gospels for the rest of your life, becoming ever more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Thank you again for all your hard work throughout these eight weeks. I look forward to teaching you again. I will see you for the class on Liturgy in the RCIA. And there might even be an elective course for you uh, before you reach the end of your program that I hope to teach. won't say anything about that now, but uh, I'll definitely see you uh, one more time before you graduate. Uh, again, thanks for everything in this course. There is a threaded discussion question. Uh, there is a reading assignment. And uh, may God continue to bless you and all you do as such faithful disciples of the Lord. Goodbye and God bless.